Hi, Andrea morsette Grizzini, founder and CEO of We The P. I want to talk about something that's scandalous. In fact, it's so scandalous, I'm not sure you're going to believe me, but I want you to hear me out because this is critical stuff. Everyone is an expert. You are an expert. Now, how do I know this? I'm sitting here talking to my MacBook Pro. There's no one else around. I have no idea who you are. You could be a seven-year-old girl. You could be a 70-something-year-old grandfather. You could be a stay-at-home mom. You could be a... Uh, homeless man with limited education, you could be someone who has been diagnosed with a disability or deficit or a disease of some sort. I don't know, but I do know you're an expert. And I'm not just saying that to flatter you. I'm saying that because I think our world needs you and many more millions of us to engage our expertise if we're going to solve the many serious problems that we face. Now, I, don't take my word for your expertise. I'm going to bring in some known experts, people that think that you'll recognize as experts to support my argument here. The first one is one I think you do know for sure, and his name is Albert Einstein, aka the genius. Uh, so Einstein had this great quote. He said, everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it's forever going to think it's stupid. Now Einstein gets three critical points here. It's, it's, he's, he's affirming what I'm saying here, that everybody's an expert or genius, right? But he's, he's defining why we don't know that. And the reason we don't know that is because we don't know how to measure all these different and various types of expertise and genius. We only have certain ways of understanding expertise and genius, so therefore we don't see the other geniuses, right? The third point he's making is the most devastating, both personally and culturally. What he's saying is that if we are defining who's experts and who's not experts, we're going to have left all these experts behind because they don't see themselves as having anything to offer. And be, when they don't have anything, see themselves as having anything to offer, and the rest of the culture doesn't see themselves them as having any expertise, that's lost opportunity, that's lost capacities to create and apply their genius to the problems and, and solutions of our culture. So, so that's that's Einstein. I'm going to bring in some more experts. Uh, uh, one is by a guy by the name of Peter Levine. Now, Peter Levine is uh, certainly one of the leading experts in the United States, if not worldwide, on measuring culture change efforts, on using uh, science to understand what works and what doesn't in culture change. Now, Levine has a new book out, and he was writing about this in his blog, and the book's title is We Are the Ones We Are Waiting For, and he's getting at what I'm getting at and what uh, Einstein's saying. He's saying we um, are experts in our world, and rather than wait for the experts to come and fix our problems, we need to apply our own expertise, our own genius, our own abilities to the problems that we're waiting for others to solve. He had an epiphany of sorts uh, recently. Now, the thesis of his book is that um, uh, he, he says there is over a million people or a million people in the United States that are in self-directed change efforts, okay? What he missed was that there's probably far more than a million, and I would entirely agree with him there. Uh, so he writes about this in, in his essay, as does another expert. Uh, this other expert is a guy by the name of Harry Boyd, and as, that, as it happens, he wrote an essay the very same day as Peter Levine did. So I thought the, the planets are aligning, they're all getting it. Now Harry Boyd's been talking about this for a long time. In fact, he's been an inspiration to some of my thinking around this. What, what Boyd has said is that all of us have something to offer, that um, there is a cult of the expert in our country and world that identifies certain people as having all the answers and pretty much everybody else is having no answers. Um, and in his recent essay, he again talks about this issue and he talks about the, uh, the biases that known quote-unquote experts have towards, um, sometimes have towards the rest of, of society, that those known experts, particularly in academia, uh, might not always respect the, the genius and the expertise of others. That shouldn't stop us, in his view and in mine as well. Just because someone doesn't see our expertise doesn't mean that we don't have it. and doesn't mean that we shouldn't apply it. Now, both Levine and Boyd were citing in, in their pieces another author by the name of uh, Alfred Zur. Now, Alfred Zur um, sees a far broader um, picture of expertise and from a from a, a scientist or researcher's view he's actually researching lay people that uh, beyond Levine's a million people that he sees out there 
Azure sees people in all kinds of different um, sectors, uh, from medicine and law and education on out, as having really constructive value to the quote unquote experts that are trying to solve problems in their organizations and communities and, and uh, environments. So what he's getting at, he, he says it, is, is the idea of bringing lay people, people that aren't known experts, into the creation, co-creation of solutions. Uh, he, he says we, we sometimes forget, as lay people, our abilities. And when we forget our abilities, we don't accept our responsibility to be part of the solutions. And that's kind of what I'm getting at. If I'm right, and these guys are right, and Einstein and many others are right, and we all have something uh, of expertise, we all have something to offer, then I think we ought to. I, I think it's and we need it, um, not only for ourselves and for our own glory, so to speak, or even our own problems alone, although that, of course, is an important thing for us to consider, but for the wider world. He, uh, in his essay, Zor, had a great quote towards the end, and it was a challenge. He said, what have you created? that will last beyond your career. What he's getting at is if we have an expertise that we can offer the world, and, be, and we all do, are we seeing it? Are we reflecting on it sufficiently to take responsibility to be sure that we leave some sort of an imprint on the world with it? And he, he leads into a conversation I had just today with a uh, uh, an, an economics um, expert, a guy by the name of Tor Dahl. Now, Mr. Dahl has been consultant to governments and presidents and prime ministers and leaders of industry and uh, business um, for decades, and also in his spare time has done tremendous volumes of research, particularly on productivity. He finds an interesting thing in his research. Um, what they found, looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of organizations and uh, uh, sectors and business types, is that the more people you apply to a problem or a product, to the creation of a solution, the more robust and sustainable outcomes you have, the more productivity you achieve. Now this counters some of the thinking in, in business circles where the thinking goes reduce cost and focus only on quality. To compete you need to have better quality than the next guy. Um, and what they found is that's not enough. In the dynamic world that we live in where contexts change from state to state in the United States, in one state you might have this sort of a need for a product and in another state you might have an entirely different need okay and if you don't put all kinds of diverse creative energies to a problem you're going to get a very limited solution and in those limited solutions you have only a limited market and when you have a limited market you've got limited outcomes okay um, which isn't to say that there's not such a thing as focusing very seriously on, on a product and, 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 and with, with tremendous focus, but it is saying that to, provide, to produce the most creative outcomes, you need a diversity of solutions and from a diversity of people, therefore, a diversity of experts, not only the unknown experts, but new experts that create what are often seen these days as disruptions. Okay, So <coughs> if you take that thinking to society, we have lots of problems that need to be solved uh, that cannot be solved only by business and only by government and only by experts, but that require the diversity of all of our abilities. Uh, Mr. Dahl um, told me about the most productive people in the world. He was asked to consult uh, and explain um, the key connective factors between the 40 most productive people in the world. What he found, first of all, or what they found in their research, fascinatingly enough, was that these 40 most productive people weren't the usual suspects necessarily. They weren't only the Steve Jobs and Bill Gates types. Um, they were a far more diverse or heterogeneous group, very different uh, people. Some were leaders, some were scientists, some were uh, educators. It, 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 there was not a defining factor in terms of what kind of work they did, okay? What was the defining connective factors was their habits, um, 
and how they came into their expertise. There were two critical factors that he pointed out to me as being remarkable. Those two factors were this. The first one was that each one of these 40 most productive people in the entire world self-identified their passion and in the practice of their passion, something that some sort of internal drive and interest and curiosity that they have and, and pursuing that, they became far more productive by sheer volume of focus that they had on this, something about themselves that they really, really cared about or just instinctively knew about and were drawn to. Okay, that was the first one. The second one, and this is profound, was that they each took time, and Mr. Dahl said weekly, to reflect on what they were doing and how they were applying their abilities and capacities to useful solutions and productive outcomes. This reflective thing is not often recognized in our fast-paced culture, but it's critical. What it gets at is our ability to take personal responsibility and personal recognition of who we are and to uh, Alfred Zurer's point, to ask ourselves, how are we taking our unique genius, our unique expertise and applying it in useful ways to our culture? Not something that we can define one time and leave it there and push for. What they found, what what uh, Mr. Dahl found in their research was that these 40 most productive people thought about this. They spent time every week and extended time every week thinking to themselves, okay, how am I going to take what I've got and offer it in bigger and better ways this week? Not next year or 10 years from now, but this week. How am I going to do that? This brings me back to an expert that I met this weekend. Uh, he is a elderly gentleman lives in Arkansas. His name is Walter Blanchard. Now Walter doesn't necessarily look like an expert if there is such a thing as what an expert looks like. I don't, I don't know that you'd look, see him on the street and say he looks like an expert. When you talk to him, he doesn't use big words, but he's brilliant. One of my uh, passions is meeting with and speaking with and learning from really, really smart people. And this man had me transfixed with his brilliance. It happened first when I walked into his antiques store. He, he, he produces some, um, now he produces um, artifacts and, and sells them at art shows. Um, but he previously had an antiques business and had some remaining pieces there, particularly the books I was interested in. So I was digging through his books while he was speaking to someone else. And, fascinated by the diversity of his books and, and the content of them, the many old books. And he picked up on that. And then he showed me more books. And he showed me all kinds of books, particularly on politics, which we both had interests in. And I was so fascinated by his knowledge that I couldn't stop talking to him and learning from him. Now, this is a man that is not considered a scholar um, in his profession. He's an, he's an antique stealer and an artist. Um, just a good man who raised his family and has tremendous knowledge and expertise because of his passion for books, because he'd spent years reading the books that he was also selling to people, because he'd built his work around his passions and his interests um, and applied those passions and interests in sharing them to create a better culture. In his way, and it's a very quiet, unassuming way, and I doubt that he even acknowledged this, but the way he's taking his passions and applying them in productive ways is by sharing them with people, like younger people like me, who didn't know all the things that he taught me until I met him, who might not understand their abilities. I heard him constantly boosting up people around him, reassuring them of their abilities to do big and important and good things, ethical things. That's one way he's using his expertise in culture. I hope he continues to, I know he will. And I hope you do too. Take some time. What are you passionate about doing? What can't you but focus on? What takes you away into uh, daydream land? I know it's not always pragmatic to spend days on end thinking, and yet take some time to. 
what are you going to leave with this world? How are you going to help the million people that Peter Levine sees out there trying to make things happen? How are you going to help the many millions of people that Alfred Zurr thinks can be productive solutions creations? How are you going to ignore a world that tells you that you're not an expert? How are you going to see yourself as an expert? And how are you going to use that expertise to help us all?